Hey, Catherine. Yeah, Christy. Why did the Japanese beetle larva molt to an adult? I don't know. Why? It was tired of being grubby. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy, a backyard gardener from Colorado. These days, gardening has gotten very popular, and my friends and I have noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Well, hello, Catherine. Hello, Christy. And hello, gardeners out there. Sometimes people are actually gardening while they're listening to the podcast, so we hope you have some good weeding to do today. Exactly. Uh, Catherine, welcome to Upside Down Tulips. Oh, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Well, listeners, you may remember Catherine's been here before because she's been the voice of Mother Goose. <laughs> and you're also a member of the garden party. Yes, I am. That is very true. Uh, Catherine, our friendship goes back... Quite when rocks were soft <laughs> is sort of how I think of it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. yes. The early part of this century. Yes, I think my we first met. Do you remember when we first met? Yes, it was when we were doing um, that play where I was the stroke victim. Fuddy Mears. Fuddy Mears, that's Curious it. Curious yes. Theater Company, like 2004 or something No, like it was like 2001 or 2002. Oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Yes, because I remember who I was working for at the time. So, oh, yeah. gotcha. Well, your memory's better than mine. And we bonded over that show. Yes, we did. But we also bonded over gardening. Yes, we did. We had a lot of conversations about gardening sitting on the steps at the front of Curious Theater Company. Oh, yes. I remember that. And, yes. you know, I was not a big vegetable gardener at the time. Oh, you weren't? No. And at, I really credit you, Catherine, for inspiring me to start growing vegetables, especially tomatoes. Oh, my God. Life life does not exist in the summer without real, honest-to-God tomatoes. I, uh, You encouraged me. I went out and bought some tomato plants and stuck them in the ground and... And voila. And look voila, at where now you look are now. It. Yeah. Yes. So it's a real treat to have you here. Well, it's... Again, it's just lovely to be here. I'm very pleased and excited to be here. <laughs> and this week we have a special interview with John Libs from Grub Gone, and he's going to talk to us all about the favorite beetle we love to hate. <laughs> yes, that evil Japanese beetle. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and some solutions maybe to our struggle against them. Is that yeah, right? I think, yeah. He's, yeah. He's kinda, you know, uh, he's pretty smart. He's very smart. And he and I think sometimes in our gardening world, we try, you know, I just like throw spaghetti at the wall and sees what happens. Yeah. And so he's got some math behind it. Well, and it's hard to sometimes to win those kind of solutions to separate, at least for me it is, to separate out what is the good stuff to use and what's truly the organic. Organic will break down and not mess with my pollinators kind of stuff or stuff that won't stay in the soil for forever. So it's really hard for me to sort through all of that because I don't have that chemistry background. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I found yeah. a lot of what he said so very helpful. Oh, good. Well, hey, Catherine, so what's going on in your garden these days? Well, the tomatoes have started to come in and I have two cherry tomato plants in particular that are really like small bushes. Oh. So I've started to have to cut out leaves so I can just see where the cherry tomatoes are. Um, <clears throat> so that's the big excitement. And my sunflowers are now in their full glory. So there are lots of pollinator action going on. Oh, nice. And some squirrels and stuff. And the blue spirea has also finally come forward. So is mine. Yes. And oh my God, we know the bees just love that. I'm always amazed at the teeny tiny little bees yeah. that appear for the blue spirea. There's so many different kinds of bees there I never are. realized. And and friends, if you don't have a blue mist spirea, we recommend it because it blooms in August. It does. And it's beautiful blue like and with kind of a silvery blue, yeah. leaves. And oh my God, the pollinators do love, love, love it. Yeah. And once it gets established, it's xeriscopic. Yes, it is. It doesn't is. need that much water. It's true. It's true. And then I also have the echinaceas are still going and my black-eyed Susans have finally come forward. Oh, I'm jealous. And, um... Yeah, and then I finally did last weekend when we had some a bit of rain. I uh, did another small section of transferring or changing my front yard 
from lawn to a no dig garden area. So oh. that's a slow but sure process. And yeah. what process are you doing with that? Well, I did watched a lot of YouTubes. And what, <laughs> what there are tubes, right? <laughs> there yeah. are tubes, yes, yes. Um, a lot of videos on this, and basically, I stopped watering so that the grass would die back in mm. the places where the weeds are more prevalent. I put down black plastic first for two or three weeks, then I water the ground, the sod that I'm gonna cover. Then I put after I've watered it really good. Then I put down newspapers that I have soaked really good too. And then on top of that, I put a layer of news of uh, cardboard, which I've also soaked really good. And then on top of that, I put two to four inches of cow compost combination. On, and then I edge it with some kind of cedar mulch, if I can find the cedar mulch. And I just am going to let it sit. Next spring is when I will start to dig holes and the idea being that all of that water now that's in the soil uh -huh. is going to be held there much better with the layers of cardboard. The cardboard and the newspaper are going to decompose. I'm going to start to add the the wonderful goobers that are in the cow compost combination are going to start to seep down and uh -huh. augment the, the soil too. So, and then I will eventually go in and start planting perennials, you know, and um, slowly but surely turn it into a much bigger pollinator garden than what I have, but I'm getting rid of lawn that way. And, you know, now the state of Colorado is actually has a bill out there that yes. will pay people to and get rid of lawn. And that will go into effect, is my understanding, next July, July of 2023, is when the state will have a program organized that will be willing to pay you X amount of square foot to transfer your lawn from grass sod into something else. Yeah, something else, just yeah. not concrete, please, exactly. friends. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and it, yeah, so that's my limited understanding of that bill. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. And how is your garden? Well, you know, Catherine, I was gone for almost three weeks. I know. Isn't that awful that you had to go away on this beautiful Europe. vacation <laughs> in Europe? And it's it's somewhat funny because my husband is, you know, my handsome and handy husband is worried about like our cats, Leo and Winnie, of and course. I'm worried about the garden. It's the but garden, yeah. My house sitters <laughs> did a very nice job. I came back and things were alive. In fact. Sometimes I wonder, Catherine, if maybe I baby my plants too much because the vegetable garden is looking great. Well, didn't you have, or didn't you mention you were going to put your um, your drip hoses yeah, on some there. kind of a, a timer device? They are on a timer, but okay. there still needs to be some unhooking and rehooking. No, no, of I understand. Hoses. Okay, some so, augmenting. So, so yeah, the house sitters had to handle that, and they they did great. Um, and isn't it interesting how sometimes you go, this is a this is a really good year for us, fill in the blank. Right. And so this year, I'm excited to say it's a really good tomato year. I'm jinxing it right now, but it's the middle of August, Catherine, and I don't, and I've been doing hybrid tomatoes. This is my second year for hybrid tomatoes. Okay. Not a blemish on any of the plants. They look fantastic. That's awesome. I've had a little wilted leaf on one, and I just kind of kept babying her along, and she seems to have recovered. So, And do you, are you pinching the wilted leaves off? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's good. Um, and also a really great cucumber year. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to pickle this weekend, and you know I love pickling. Yes, you do. So, and I have... I'll, you'll have to come out afterwards and look at this butternut squash vine. Okay. It is the most beautiful butternut squ squash vine I have ever had. And there, I think I have like five or six squash on it right oh, now. Oh, that's so impressive. Really, on the downside is yes. that I still, for the life of me, cannot grow zucchini. <laughs> Be thankful for small favors from the <laughs> goddess, dear. Be thankful. I never thought of my life, but this is the second year in a row. I did, you know, I had... Um, I mistakenly again planted summer squash instead of zucchini. So I went in early August and I bought a sad little plant. Right. It was kind of left over from a nursery. Right. And not the nursery's fault. It was just, you know, near the end of the season. No, exactly. Yeah. And I planted it and it's alive. But that's about but it. But it's small and it has a blossom on it. So I'm hoping between now and the frost... I will get zucchini. Right. But you know what I had to do this week, Catherine? No. I had to buy zucchini. Oh, honey. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, that's why the goddess gave us farmer's markets. 
Exactly. <laughs> right. Somebody else's success. I just can't believe yes. that I had to do that. Um, and it was also this week, it was National Sneak Some Zucchini on your neighbor's <laughs> fourth day. <laughs> And I didn't have any to you sneak. You didn't have any. any to sneak. Oh, yeah. man. And also, nobody snuck any. I'm, I, that was the one day I wish somebody would have snuck some zucchini on my porch. Just to have it appear in your mailbox. Yeah. yeah. Nada. Yeah. Zippo on the zucchini. So, it, incredibly disappointing on that front. And uh, what else is going on here? Um, oh, um, I wanted to give folks an update on my African marigolds. Oh, yes. Yes. So, this was a marigold i got from botanical interest last year and i don't know if you remember this Catherine, but these marigolds they were like the size of baseballs big pom-poms they were yellow and gold and orange and i collected seeds from it and i gave it to a bunch of people saying you're gonna love these marigolds they are huge pom-poms and i kind our grandmothers used to grow planted them again and then I realized, oh, Christy, these are hybrids. Yeah. Didn't quite turn out the same, I take it. They're still nice. And they're still, right. like, they're still a good size marigold, but not like the ones I had last year, which just means I'm going to have to fork over the dollar twenty nine again to buy seeds from Botanical Interest. Well, but give I'd... up one zucchini <laughs> cost, and then you can use that money to uh-huh. buy. Yeah. Okay, but you said good, the good, good. entity you bought the seeds from was Botanical Interest. Yes, yeah, such a great company. Do you oh, ever get their seeds? No, out? no, no. They are uh they're a national company and we've actually had the president as a guest on the podcast before. Oh, okay. And they are known for one, they have these beautiful illustrations on the front, uh artwork of their plants of the and flowers. But also yeah. they have if you open the packet inside, they're the only seed company that has information on the inside of the packet. Excellent. Extra little information. It has like little drawings of the seedlings so you can identify them. Yeah, so when they're coming up and you don't get confused with weeds or something. Yeah. 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 And it'll have um, uh, recipes or other little interesting tidbits about the plants. Interesting. So, and guess where they're based out of? Beautiful Broomfield, Colorado. Well, I did not know that. And it's always good to buy local. That's awesome. That's totally awesome. It is. Good. So... You need to check out our website for the funny and informative upside down tulip dictionary if we've used any terms that you didn't understand. And that's at upside down tulips altogether.com. Or you can click on the link on one of our show notes. And we have some fun stuff on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And Coming up, we have a brand new pod play Mm -hmm. for everybody that um, I was inspired to write. Catherine, because this summer I have lost three garden forks. Oh, no. Do you ever do that? You're out in the garden and you're doing stuff and working away. The gnomes have been busy in this part of Denver. Yes, maybe Mm -hmm. it is the gnomes, but everybody sit back and enjoy Colorado Jones and Raiders (laughs) of the Lost Fork. He discovered the Temple of Bloom and conquered the last Cruciferous, and defeated the kingdom of the Thistle. And now, prepare for an adventure movie that will have you on the edge of your garden stool, Colorado Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Fork. With this map, I can find the missing garden fork. Featuring Dame Judy Dench. For thousands of years, gardeners have been searching for the lost garden fork. It's not something to be taken lightly. One moment it was there, and then it was gone. No one knows its secrets. With thrilling moments of cartography. According to the map, the lost garden fork should be right over here. Careful, Colorado. There's a rose bed Ah! with Canadian thistle Yikes! and poison ivy. Crap. And chase scenes that defy the laws of physics. Watch out, Colorado. We've got company. Pardon me, excuse Excuse me. me. Excuse me. Pardon Pardon me. me. Excuse Excuse me. me. Excuse Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Fruit Fruit cars! And even more creepy crawlies. Japanese beetles. Why did it have to be Japanese beetles? And riddles. There are so many garden forks. Which one is the lost garden fork? You must choose the right garden fork, but choose wisely. And a plot twist that everyone will see coming. 
Yes, this is the Lost Garden Fork. It is beautiful. Hey, what the- Thank you, Colorado Jones. What was once briefly yours is now mine. <laughs> Why do I keep falling for this? Colorado Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Fork, coming to a theater near you. Well, friends, you know, when I am out and about and come across friends, especially friends who garden, invariably the conversation comes around to Japanese beetles. And we've talked about Japanese beetles a lot on this podcast before. If you want to learn a bit more in detail, check out episode 49 on Japanese beetles. And you may also know that every now and then, we feel it is important to bring in an expert. And today, folks, we have for you a real treat. We have a scientist. Joining us today is John Libs, who is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and he has worked as a scientist in the biotechnology field for over 30 years. He is currently the CEO of Phylum Bioproducts Corporation, which is concerned with environmental issues that are impacting plants and crops and agriculture and landscapes and forestry and backyards. With his team, he has developed organic products that control borers, beetles, and weevils. And he joins us today from sunny California, just outside of San Jose. Welcome, John Libs, to Upside Down Tulips. Hi, Christy. Hi, Catherine. How are you doing today? We're so glad to have you here because it is Japanese beetle season. Um, before we get to talk about our favorite beetle we love to hate, Popelia japonica, John, how is your garden going? And can you share with our listeners some of your favorite garden mistakes? Oh, favorite garden mistake. Well, you know, like uh, I, have a, I have a couple fruit trees in the yard and spent quite a bit of time fertilizing and watering this year. Plum tree in particular, I was able to pull uh, quite a bit of fruit off of it uh, last year, right right on July 4th weekend, actually. So I was pretty much anticipating the, the same uh, timing this year on uh, pulling the plums off the tree and handing them out on July 4th weekend. Well, I had a, I had a, a business trip. To, uh, it was about a two-week trip uh, right before that. I saw birds picking at them a little bit uh, before I left. And boy, uh, when I returned, I climbed up in the tree and lo and behold, no plums left. So uh, the, the birds uh, at the top of the tree didn't leave me any plums up there. Got turkeys running around in the area. And they, the last year, I saw them jumping up in the tree and, and grabbing all the low-hanging fruit. And uh, lo and behold, they, they had stripped the bottom, they had stripped the top, and stripped the middle. Even though I serviced the ag industry, I forgot to, uh, you know, things change year over year. And uh, you sort of have to pay attention to all the different variables going on out there. So battling turkeys and birds the only thing you're missing are squirrels john and then you'd have the trifecta of villains on your plum tree yeah yeah that, that's true <laughs> I, I don't know what picked the uh, plums out of the middle of the tree maybe i missed uh, seeing a few squirrels uh, oh. before but uh, i don't know something was getting the middle of the tree as well so anyway i, uh. I ended up with seven uh, juicy plums <laughs> oh. oh well you know my heart goes out to you and fingers crossed next year will be a good plum year for you I'll pay, I'll pay a little closer attention next year. <laughs> <laughs> I had that with strawberries this year. Last year I had this amazing strawberry year. And you know, this year I forgot to, I should have, I had it in my garage. I have bird netting to protect my strawberries and I didn't. And the squirrels came in and one day and took them all. Is that right? Wow. Unfair. Yeah, well, they, they get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. They sure do. Well, John. Why do we hate Japanese beetles so much? They're such a pretty little beetle. I think they're, you know, they're green metallic and copper colors are so charming. And yet we hate them. Why is that? Well, I think the folks uh, would like them if they would just live in harmony with your roses out there. But uh, unfortunately, they, they like the squirrels like to eat. Uh, they have a voracious appetite. So uh, really the difference between Japanese beetle and, and, most other scare beetles, not all, but uh, most, is that they're uh, voracious uh, foliar feeders. So, uh, you know, they they go after the foliage. Unfortunately, y'all know out there in Denver, 
uh, and they, they actually feed on over 300 different types of plants across North America. So they're, they're a big problem, not only in uh, home and garden landscape care, but they're a big pest in ag crop as well. We, uh, we sell a lot of products and I, I service the ag industry direct. So I, I work with farmers, growers and, and Japanese beetle, really, they take out grapes, blueberries, uh, you know, ornamental trees as well, linden trees, all sorts of different plants. So they're, they're a big problem across the U.S. now. I noticed them on a different plant this year that I never had before, which I noticed them on marigolds this year. And I just thought, boy, they're just not getting picky about what they like to munch on, do they? Yeah, that's, you know, uh, uh, mother nature adapts, let's say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, there's been invasive species, yeah. There's been invasive species, pest species out there uh, where folks have really concentrated and, and tried to either remove uh, plants that are the liking of a particular type of pest. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's had some limited success, but, you know, when, when bugs will adapt, if they don't, you know, find their favorite plant, they'll just go to the next one. And, and feed on that one. So it, it, it can be a real struggle to uh, try to knock down certain invasive pests. It seems to me one of the ways to get the upper hand on Japanese beetles is to understand their life cycle. So what is their life cycle like, John? Well, they, uh, they basically go through one generation season. So let's say uh, at, at this point in time, I, I would imagine uh, most folks have seen uh, the adult beetles, the pretty little beetles that are flying around, disappear. Um, and, and right now they've burrowed into the ground to uh, lay eggs. And at about this time, those eggs will start hatching out. Once the eggs are laid, it takes about two weeks. The larvae hatch out. Uh, and, and those are really the larvae to target with uh, uh, grub gone or beetle gone. Um, and then the, the larvae will continue to feed on the roots of turf, let's say, or if the hatch out in the garden, uh, they'll, they'll feed on the roots of plants. They'll uh, pupate, they'll grow throughout the fall. And then when it hits, uh, you know, 50 degrees, 40, they start heading deeper into the soil profile where they'll be basically overwinter and then when the uh, soil profile warms up to somewhere around 50 degrees Fahrenheit next spring, they'll work their way back up and start feeding again and then uh, pop out as adult beetles. Uh, and unfortunately, you've seen, seen all of that, uh, <laughs> That's that, right. that type of event. Uh, you mentioned your products, Grub Gone and Beetle Gone. And... Um, and friends who are listening, this is how John and I met was because I heard about his product, Grub Gone, and I bought it and reached out to John to see if he'd be interested in chatting with us. And I've been very impressed with the customer service you have there because I got a bag of it. Um, it was mailed to me. The bag, friends, was uh, 60 bucks. Shipping was free. I got it within a couple days, and I applied it onto my lawn in about maybe early June, and so this is this is when the Japanese beetles are still in the grub stage, and I've tried other things before too, but as you know, friends, in Upside Down Tulips, we like to do things organically, so yes, there are pesticides out there that you can apply, but we encourage you to look for organic options. Now, you may have also heard of milky spore, or we also do the soap and water method, but I, uh, can you tell us more, John, about how uh, Grub Gone works? Oh, sure. Yeah, there, there's really three windows of application for the product. And, and that's what makes it uh, really a, a special non-chemical type product. So you, you applied in that first window of application. That's where most of the traditional chemistries uh, are applied in turf. And, and part of that is simply because uh, landscaper or even homeowners, they wanna be pretty efficient about fertilizing and laying down grub control. So they do it all at once. Uh, you know, a lot of times that's in the spring uh, or, or early summer. And, and you're right, the, the grubs are feeding. Those are the overwinter grubs. They're, they're fairly large. Um, they, they are feed quite a bit. 
they are the tougher grub to kill because they are larger and hardier. Uh, but it, it's a good time to put the uh, product on. Uh, what makes our product uh, really quite a bit different than most uh, non-chemical or, or what we would say biological products is that it just lasts quite a, relatively quite a long time in the soil profile. So you do get uh, performance out of that product if you lay it down in that first window of application all through the summer to this point of time and into the fall. So that, that is special. Most biological products do not last very long. What makes it different than milky spore is um, it, it contains an active ingredient, pro protein, and a lot of it. And uh, milky spore does not. Um, so we don't rely on, let's say, the spores to build over, you know, two to three seeds to possibly you know, perform and have some activity. That's not how this type of microbial product works. You have gratification in the first season because it will perform well the first season. Um, then there's two other windows of application. Again, I, I mentioned it uh, a little while ago. This second window of applications around egg hat. And at that point, you're targeting the, 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 the smallest larvae, the easiest to kill larvae that have just hatched out of the egg. Um, and again, the product will last through the fall. And then the third window uh, treatment is really the, the fall treatment, and we call it a rescue treatment. And typically what happens is folks, if they don't realize that they have a grub problem and they start seeing damage, they're looking for an application to try to knock down and reduce the damage uh, throughout the fall or perhaps knock down the population so they have less of a problem in the spring. Uh, and, you know, with all the products, too, they are not 100 percent effective. I mean, a lot of the chemistries work work very, very well. The uh, midocloprids, the bear advanced, but they have all their downside problems. Uh, you know, the, the Grub X works at about the same level as the Grub Gun, uh, which is performing uh, 80 percent, 85, 90 percent control knocks down or kills nine out of 10 grubs, let's say. Uh, but you 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 may still have a little bit of breakthrough. And uh, a lot of folks will put down a little more product in the fall to uh, try to mitigate any breakthrough damage they see. So those are really the three windows of application. Um, and so now here we are in mid-August. Is it too soon to apply in the Denver metro area some grub gone to prevent uh, Japanese beetles in the spring? No, no, this is a very good time. Uh, any any opportunity you have to knock down the population for next year is a positive step to take. So you could actually either use grub gone and and spread this granule on the turf, or a lot of folks, uh, you know, they purchase uh, the sprayable version of the product uh, that you mix in water and spray for protecting foliage of you know, your gardens or ornamental plants like roses, you can also spray that for grub control. So what, what typically happens is uh, any of the products, uh, you're, you're going to have some breakthrough in, in some, some numbers of beetles that survive. Maybe they fly in late in the season, um, already split, sprayed your chemical or the beetle gone, uh, and they just escape. Uh, the prod, right? So now they're hanging around and, uh, you know, that they, they're going to lay eggs and that they're, they're going to be opportunistic and lay eggs where there's food and water. And that's either in your turf or your garden. So if you saw beetle problems in the summer, there's likely going to be some grubs in the same areas. So you can, you can apply beetle gone, spray it, mix in water, spray it on turf or on soil. Um, you can mix it into your soil dry or go ahead and use the grub gone on turf, uh, spreading it like you would spread your fertilizer. And uh, we've talked about grub gone and the other product, the spray product, beetle gone, as being organic. Uh, can you talk to us more about that, John? Oh, sure. Uh, so the, these products, uh, this type of product, the underlying technology has a very long uh, track record of safety. It's, it's, you know, BT based products, this type of microbes been used in agriculture extensively for quite a long time in, in what we call IPM programs, integrated pest management, uh, which is, uh, it, it, it really has been mixed with chemicals worldwide 
for a good 50, 60 years. And it is the number one type of non-chemical insecticide used worldwide now. Uh, organic farmers also use this type of product uh, for organic farming. It is a approved or certified national organic program. It's also OMRI certified. Uh, it, it, they just have a very good uh, track record of safety. And, and really, if, if folks are interested, the, the EPA and the PMRA up in Canada, the regulatory agencies, they do, they do publish uh, 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 publicly uh, safety records of different types of products. And if you, if you look at the safety record, the, these types of products, including ours, are, are very, very safe. And oh, it does not hurt pollinators, right? No bees or butterflies. That, that's right. That's, that's correct. It, no, no beneficial insects uh, are targeted with, with our products. That includes uh, bees, honeybees, uh, butterflies, uh, other, other important uh, beneficial insects, even ladybugs. So ladybugs a beetle or ladybird beetle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we got lucky on this one. And also okay for pets and for people to walk around? Yes, it is. So again, the, these proteins, the active ingredient protein, they, they're very targeted. Uh, so that they do target certain insects, certain beetles, weevils, and borers, but not mammals. And 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 when you register a product like these, uh, it, it's it's a very extensive process. Uh, we we undertake uh, a broad spectrum of so, uh, toxicity studies, toxicology studies, and and uh, no no toxicity to mammals, birds, fish, obviously including pets. And the water supply too, correct? It is there. There's uh, so as part of again this <laughs> this regular package, we test against water invertebrates, which are pretty much the bottom of the food chain, uh, food for fish, etc. Uh, no toxicity even to these little little water invertebrates. So uh, yeah, BT-based products like ours are very, very safe. In fact, uh, you know, BT-based products, these types of microbial products, they're, they're used for mosquito abatement and have been for decades. And, and actually, if, if you're ever out uh, in you know, areas that have uh, mosquito issues, that they use these type of products in the water purposely to control mosquito mm. larvae. These type of products are aerial shade uh, for control of uh, uh, caterpillars of moths that are very destructive in forestry, especially in northern tier states, U.S. and Canada, like diamondback moth and spruce budworm. And mm. they aerially spray these types of products over national forests. So, I, I mean, given all the safety track record, you know, we always recommend if you're spraying your fruits and vegetables, you know, you no matter what type of product you use, uh, even soap, wash your fruits and vegetables before you eat them. That that's just good practice. That's the best way to mm-hmm. to go. And I think most people, common sense, of course, do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, safe track. Good point. Well, um, I applied in June, and um, then I left for like a three week vacation. And before I left, I saw one Japanese beetle. And when I came home, I did see a s- small amount of Japanese beetles. Um, but interestingly enough, not on my roses. My roses look impeccable. Uh, where they liked to go is on the Virginia creeper, which in some parts of the country people say, fine, but let it, let it take the Virginia creeper. And I also noticed it on my morning glories, but I could say it's less. And... Um, especially when like nobody was really out there for three weeks, John, doing any maintenance, you know, putting Japanese beetles in soapy water buckets or anything like that. Um, I'm very, very pleased with the product. Um, right now, I do see there's a lot of mating happening in my backyard. Looks like an orgy of Japanese beetles on <laughs> a plant or two. But then I just sweep them into a little bucket. So I can really, I feel pretty happy that it's that it's less, and I'm going to do another application then. And friends, this bag that I bought did half of my yard. I have a front yard and a backyard, and so I'm going to use the re- the other half, probably in a couple weeks to get the you know to get ready for the winter. And I think sixty bucks a year to 
have less Japanese beetles is a deal. <laughs> and we'll put links for your website, John, in the show notes here about how people can get uh, beetle gone and grub gone. Oh, and I wanted to say one other thing is that there's a difference, friends, between beetle gone and grub gone. And there's another product called beetle be gone or grub be gone. But it has that B in the middle. That's a pesticide. And so, and that is not organic. So just be careful about which one you're going to get, that you're looking for Beetle Gone or Grub Gone from Phylone Bioproducts. John, thank you so much for joining us. It was wonderful to have a scientist and all your knowledge. And I so appreciate how you care for farmers and forests and even my little backyard. Hey, I, I appreciate the uh, interest and we're always here to, to serve the customers and, uh, you know, we, we do, uh, we do answer emails and, and there's, there's always a lot of uh, questions and answers of how to apply products and timing and all the different topics we talked about. So we, we take pleasure in uh, helping folks out and uh, helping them solve a problem here. Well, you're the best, John. Thank you so much for coming to us today. Thanks so much. Yeah, you bet. You bet, Chrissy. Thank you very much. You take care. Have a good week. Upside Down Tulips is brought to you by the local chapter of the National Quality Control Council of Bossy Bovine Boo. Patty Patty Cake here, president of the local chapter of the National Quality Control Council of Bossy Bovine Poo or as we call ourselves, the Poo Patrol. (laughs) We believe the most contented bovines offer the best poo possible. Their comfort is our mission. The first thing we pay attention to is the quality and quantity of food. That is the best grasses possible, frequent treats of alfalfa. Alfalfa in the winter is just munching heaven for the bossies. Mm -mm. They love being turned loose on the picked cornfield. They'll have it cleaned up in no time. Second is proper shade options, especially in those hot summer months. A good grove of trees to recline under after a good munch down is a must while the bossies work their cud. We like to see big canopied shade trees in the pasture. Next is a dependable water feature, not only for safe, secure hydration with nice fresh water, but also an area for just some good standing in the pond time. Nothing soothes bovine nerves like a good old soap. Comforting those hard-working hooves and, well, it's like a spa, really. It just relaxes the entire bovine body, easing the digestive process, creating spectacular, multifaceted quality manure. And we don't want those bossies getting bored, either. So, there needs to be some engaging stimulation and entertainment options. Bird watching, for example, from the previously mentioned shaded grove, or a road nearby to offer the antics of humans in their vehicles kicking up some dust now and again. Poor kids, riding by on their bicycles is always good for a bovine chuckle or two. Bovines appreciate the activities of the natural world enormously, so good landscaping always provides stimulation and endless entertainment possibilities. Little known fact, bovines appreciate good music, the sound of a brass quartet, and a lot of dairy cows are partial to Mozart when it comes to milking time. (laughs) I personally saw a herd be mesmerized by accordion music in Ireland. They were particularly enamored with polkas. And last but certainly not least is the need for a beautiful pastoral landscape offering breathtaking sunrises and sunsets. The landscape should offer a lovely horizon of mountain peaks or rolling prairie hills to feast those bovine eyes on while meditatively working some tasty little blue stem grass cud. Honestly, 
There is nothing better any bovine could ask for on the planet. So we at the Bossy Bovine Poo Patrol are always working to keep the cattle happy and contented so they can offer us the best manure ever for our composting work. Happy bovines make the best poo possible! Upside Down Tulips and the Bossy Bovine Poo Patrol, helping you have the best gardens ever. Catherine, I love patty patty cake and bossy bovine poo. And you know what I think my mo- when we recorded this, my most yeah. fun was when you and I just started doing all our different moo we sounds. Did the ad lib of the moo sounds. The various attitudes of bovines. Yeah. Yes. Uh, different attitudes of cows. That. Exactly. It was, it was hard not to laugh during that. It's well, true. Uh, that John Libs sure was interesting, wasn't he? He was very interesting and so articulate and he didn't get too sciencey when he was explaining how um grub gone and beetle gone work Mm -hmm. and i was stunned when he said that uh, japanese beetles besides being incredibly voracious that there's over 300 plants that they will munch on yeah i had no idea that they were that what's the word I want, widespread, or that they they were that indiscriminate in terms of their palate. And a little scary when he said that Very. they will learn and they will just jump to different plants too. Yes. Like, oh, great. Yeah. Because like I, I'm, you know, it's true that I really haven't had that many, but when I did see a bunch, it was all on one of those African marigolds. Oh. And maybe there were like 15 on there having a big old orgy. I had had them on um, a marigold plants two summers ago, oh. and I was just like, oh, my God. I thought the reason why we planted marigolds, other than they're pretty, was to keep them from the insect thing. Right. The natural repellent. So, yeah, I found that very interesting. And then his just talking about the organic component of the, the magic protein, I believe he said, that's that's in the grub gone, mm-hmm. that and how it works and also that it doesn't linger in the soil for long, long, long periods of time, that it slowly, gradually breaks down. I just was pleased to know how organically based the yeah. product is. And that's why it's a little bit more on the spendy side. But as you pointed out in the interview, I mean, 60 bucks a year for maintenance and to not have to deal with, you know, Japanese beetles. Oh, my God. That's, and almost all garden products are pricey anymore. It's just the bottom line. You know, but 60 bucks isn't really that much. Yeah. And especially when you think about there are a lot of other ways that you can do make things yourself. Yes. If you're going to spend money on something, boy, I would spend it on getting rid of Japanese people. Exactly. <laughs> and it's something that, that apparently works. So that's, yeah. And he, it was very educational too, uh, learning the sort of the three windows that you have to be able to apply these products. Yeah. That was helpful to me too, because I really didn't understand sort of the life cycle of the Mm -hmm. beetle that well. So that was very, that was very helpful to me. Yeah. In order to kill it, you must learn (laughs) how it works. (laughs) You look out, Japanese beetles. Here we come. Hey, Catherine. Guess what time it is? Mailbag time. Ring, ring. All right. This is a letter from Anne from Pennsylvania. Dear Upside Down Tulips, I live in a semi-rural area that has recently seen some er, development. Okay, neighbors. And until a few years ago, I had a canine companion who roamed the yard by day. The gray squirrels have for many years kept to the woodlots beside our property, but alas, no more. Squirrels recently found that they could scale my wire fence, the one that keeps out voles and groundhogs and deer and rabbits, and this afternoon I chased two of them out of my truck patch. It may be the circumstances have necessitated clever squirrel problem solving, a current drought, and an abundance of sunflowers in my garden. Boy, do they love sunflowers. And unlike the resident goldfinches who extract one seed at a time, squirrels, well, you know squirrels, they are the metaphorical pigs of the suburbs. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Frankly, I am fine if squirrels share with the local birds, but I have the distinct impression that squirrels will not stop at sunflower seed gobbling. It is high tomato season here, and I've also got beans, sweet peppers, eggplants, and squash. It's been hard enough keeping insects and other plant predators at bay. 
as you are city dwellers and have no doubt some battles with these quasi-adorable pests, I am writing for advice. What tack should I take first, and what's the cheapest to try, since I am a cheapskate? Thank you so much, and I await your wisdom. P.S. I will ignore advice suggesting I get another dog. I would love another dog, but now <laughs> is not the time. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Oh, squirrels. Squirrels, squirrels, squirrels are too smart for their own good. Yeah. Oh, my God. They And the problem with them as mammals is they are remarkable problem solvers yeah and they learn from each other it just they're they're pretty amazing they pass knowledge down through yes, generations yes so yeah what they, have you done before well i have had a dog too which i found very helpful <laughs> okay. um and we're done thanks man <laughs> exactly and finish it exactly um I have gotten for this year, because I grow a kind of um, heirloom tomato, um, I have gotten some that's supposed to be non-chew through um, fencing from Garden Supply mm. that I am going to put around two of my cages, oh. uh, hopefully. I haven't done it yet, so I don't know if this will work or not. I'm going to try that. And my second option, I am doing, quite frankly, since my garden, too, is kind of at its most abundant right now is I'm feeding the squirrels extra food. You know, I over have heard across that. the yard. Yes. <laughs> sort of like the the tactic of if you're gonna get a Japanese tr beetle trap, give it to your neighbor down the street. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's, I, I mean I'm trying that. I don't know. It's really else. hard. And I too, like Anne, have a bazillion sunflower plants. Because I love the goldfinches and the birds yeah. love them and the pollinators love them, but they aren't, yeah. See, my squirrels are stupid, Catherine, because mm -hmm. they don't wait for the sunflowers to go into seed. They just nip off the heads. I'm like, if you would just wait oh, no, no, a that's, couple that's, weeks. That's for a part of their pantry. <laughs> that 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 is the early stuff oh that God. they have, and then they they get the ones that oh. have the seeds that that's the aged section. Is that but right? that's yeah, okay. They, they want the early stuff for their salads right now. Yeah. Well, I also have another theory, which I don't know if it's true or not. Okay. But that squirrels will go for your tomatoes when they are thirsty, and that's why they take one bite and just leave the rest there. Well, one because they're assholes, but two because they're Wankers. thirsties. They're thirsty. So um, I have, I have no, I don't know if this is true or not, but I noticed that if I keep my bird bath full. That's an interesting hypothesis because I have a couple of new water features in my yard, which are predominantly for the birds and, and the, and mm -hmm. the pollinators. <clears throat> so I'll have to see if, yeah, if that makes a difference, but I like that thought. Yeah, it makes sense. I think sense. that makes sense. Yeah. Now some people also put the pepper. You know, yes. have to come in there. Um, Cayenne pepper sprinkled then, around the plants. And maybe that could last for a little bit. Or maybe you find a squirrel that likes things spicy. And yeah. Then, Just, and I yeah. know some people will also, you know, uh, trap and move away. Yes. But, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So, it, yeah. And just another squirrel family is just going to move in. Exactly. Or they're just going to have more babies because they have like two to three litters a year. They actually have two. They have one in the spring, and then they have one. Oh, that makes mid, sense. I want to say Augusty. That makes sense because yeah. I think I saw a little mm -hmm. squirrel the other day in my yard. I don't oh, see man. the little squirrel so much as I notice when the mothers are nursing because right now I host probably twenty-seven generations of squirrels <laughs> in my sure. backyard since Joey passed away five years ago. Yes. Oh uh, well. They, maybe they are like Japanese beetles that way, too, because Japanese beetle females will mate several times during the year. Right, event. right, exactly. So. Oh, Anne, I wish we had a really succinct answer for you. Yeah, but try feeding them something else far away from what you like. And also say. try offering them a water source, again, mm -hmm. far away from where your, your garden patches are, Yeah, you know, and see if that helps at yeah. all. Be like Jane Goodall and take very detailed records and try different things excellent. and report back to us, please. That is an excellent <laughs> thing. Yes, please, Jane, good all those squirrels for us. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Well, folks, if you have questions or comments, you want to share your successes and flops with squirrels with us, will you please write to us at upside down tulips at gmail or at our website at upside down tulips.com. So, Christy. 
you have our inspiration of the week for us? Yes, I do. I discovered this yesterday, and I thought it was very appropriate to what the weather is. This is by Peter Mayle. There is nothing I like better at the end of a hot summer's day than taking a short walk around the garden. You can smell the heat coming up from the earth to meet the cooler night air. Amen. That's lovely. That's lovely. Well, thank you everyone for listening to Upside Down Tulip this week. We are Christy Montour Larson and Catherine Gray. And if you got some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, could you do us a favor? Hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts. And thank you so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you want more, go to denisegentilini.com or you can find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. And join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and amaze you. And don't forget, Catherine, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down to you.